Australian paramedics respond to more than 9,000 calls for help every day. We've got at least two patients down. Working around the clock. Twist slowly, one leg at a time. Fighting to save lives. Ready, set, go. Cameras across Melbourne. <laughs> give unprecedented access. Hold on, people. You're OK. To the daily lives. Sweet of these emergency service heroes. Tonight on Paramedics... I'm going to need you to start CPR. A distraught mother makes a frantic call for help. One, two, three, four. A bit faster. As Karina and Dodsey race to save her son's life. No. Dude, you need to stop so we can get through. It's a good one. A hair-raising account from a dog bite victim. I went, rah! I went, rah! Oh, look at that. And the ultimate selfie oh. spells disaster for teenager Hannah. services. I need an ambulance. My son's just had a in the car and now he's gasping. OK. Going blue. OK. At Victoria's Emergency Communications Centre, a desperate mother is on the line. How old is he? He's 11. 11. Is he awake? Yeah, he's got his eyes open, but okay. he's gasping. Is he still having a fit? Yeah. Is he breathing? Really struggling. OK, I'm just organising help, darling. Stay on the phone. <laughs> people. Push out. Mobile intensive care paramedics Karina and Dodsey are on their way, lights and sirens, to the paediatric case. It's time critical code one. The patient was a pregnant baby. Roger. If a seizure patient doesn't get immediate treatment, they risk brain damage, organ failure and ultimately death. So every second counts. No, Whoa. everyone just Ready. one way or the other, people. Is he still having the seizure? He's not twitching, but he's gasping. OK, I'm going to need you to start CPR. So what you need to do is get him out of the car and lay him flat on his back on the ground. I need help getting him out of the car. Just tell me when you've done that. I've got a friend helping him out. Hang on a sec. Just as fast as you can, we are organising help. He's on the ground now. Good job. So place the heel of your hand on the breastbone in the centre of the chest. You need to pump the chest hard and fast at least twice per second and five centimetres deep. CPR in progress. The goalpost just moved. The most important thing to us is to get there as fast as we can to get there on time. Keep going. Dude, you need to stop so we can get through. It really makes your heart start to punch a little bit faster when you go into this, knowing that, you know, this could be a really bad outcome. We're going to do it 600 times or until help can take over. <laughs> In Melbourne's outer east, single responder Cullen is also battling heavy traffic. He's been dispatched to an horrific road accident where a car and motorbike have collided. The motorcyclist is unconscious. We need to determine whether the unconsciousness is due to a, a traumatic brain injury or whether he's bleeding from other injuries. This patient sounds critically unwell. In the last decade, more than 400 motorcyclists have lost their lives on Victorian roads. Thousands more seriously injured. It's so insane, isn't it? We're in Alliance and Science here, 130, and he's weaving past us. We don't want another accident on the way to the one we're already going to. Cullen arrives to a confronting scene. Emergency crews are already there. Fuel is spilling dangerously onto the road from the badly smashed motorbike. Multiple paramedics are attempting to save the unconscious rider. So just give you a quick hand over. Yeah. GCS 3. The news is chilling. The GCS is the Glasgow Coma Score, which is a scale between 3 and 15 of the level of consciousness that a patient has. Someone who has a GCS of 15 is conscious, walking around, talking normally. A GCS of 3 is the next step towards death. 
His BP was just under 180. All right. He's lying there motionless, unconscious, which is a sign that he's got a significant brain injury. He also looks like he's got some internal bleeding. And my first thoughts are that this guy has a high chance of dying. I need you to keep going with the compressions, OK? Back at the emergency communication centre, a desperately scared mother is on the line. Her 11-year-old son is gasping for air after a dangerous seizure. So it needs to be at this speed. One, two, three, four. Are you doing that now? Yep. Good job. Count out loud for me. One, two, three, four. A bit faster. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Keep going. One, two, three, four. Four. What was your name? Jenny. Jenny, you were doing a good job. We're going to keep going until we can get to 600 or the ambulance takes over, OK? Left. Micah paramedics Karina and Dodsey are receiving constant updates as they battle heavy traffic. But they're still at least a kilometre away and every minute matters. You are clear on these three lanes. One, two, three, four. Keep going. Yeah, we're only about a minute away, guys. He's breathing. He's just gasping. I need you to keep going with compressions, OK? Uh, it's not looking. Dude, it's did you looking. even look, no, Jack? He's not looking. You've got lights and sirens going. You're in a big white truck. Being a dad and having kids myself, that makes the whole thing more height. You just want people out of your way so you can get there. Keep going. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, One, two, three, four. One, In the emergency two, communication three, centre, a call taker is giving CPR instructions to a terrified one, mother. Two, three, the woman's 11-year-old son has just suffered a life-threatening seizure. Is he responding? Oh, he's trying to sit up. Oh, he's trying to sit up. OK, that's all right. If he's trying to sit up, you can stop with the compressions. Good job. I'm just going to update the ambulance here. Just stay on the phone. Uh, there's something on the floor here. Dodzy and Karina are finally on the scene. After trying to get up, the boy is once again lying motionless on the footpath. Hey, guys. They're here now. OK, all right, good job, Jenny. I'll leave you with them. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey. I look down, and he's got that just-had-a-seizure look about him, that confused, sort of dazed look about him. But at least we know that he's breathing. He's still with us. What's happened today? Okay, so well, last night this little one fainted mm -hmm. and he's been sick and we've been to the doctor this morning. She's given him some meds to help with the nausea mm -hmm. and we've just picked up his brother from school and we started fishing in the back and his eyes went really huge and he's gasping for air so I pulled over and then called Triple O and he's just gasping. Sure. I got it. What's his name? Thomas. Thomas. Wake up for me. Mum and Dad? No. No. Pass the bike. Oh, stop. Good Thank work, you very Jack. much. Oh, Mum. Yep. His mum was pumping away on his chest, so we um, just pulled over. And I think you'd do that for anyone. I'd hope someone would do that for, for one of my boys. So Thomas was obviously prem at 24 yeah, weeks. weeks. Any other past history? So he's got oh, cerebral okay. palsy, autism. He had the hole in the heart that's been replaced. He did suffer from pulmonary hypertension. He's had chronic lung disease. So. So Thomas has gone through a lot of complications. Being undeveloped as a child would have led to some of these things. And that concerns me, because it could be other things underlying going on for Thomas. Thomas. Perhaps another seizure or something else that's probably not quite right. Thomas. Thomas, wake up for me now. Wake up for me now. OK, we need some straight onto the board, onto the bed, into yeah. the back. Yeah. In Melbourne's outer eastern suburbs, single responder Cullen has been called to a motorcyclist who's fighting for his life. He's had uh, 50 of fentanyl, yep. 20 of ketamine, still quite agitated. Yep. Thrown from his bike after colliding with a car, the critically injured man is now barely conscious and moaning in pain. Somebody at his shoulder, somebody at his hips. I've got his head. One, two, three, up. Walk down the side. Slowly. Cullen suspects his patient has potentially fatal internal bleeding and a traumatic head injury. We'll just start moving him into the back of the ambulance. I'm just going to jump in the side. Loading and going, or...? We're just going to shut the doors, have a look, have a look at the injuries, and make a decision, right? Yep. 
When a patient has a traumatic brain injury, we'll often put those patients into an induced coma to protect their brain from any further damage or secondary brain injury. But the drugs we use to do that can make the bleeding internally worse. Is he still yeah. extensively tachycardic? Yeah, or... it's a hard yeah. 180. It's a balancing act. If we intubate the patient or put them in an induced coma, it will protect their brain from further injury. But if we do that procedure, it may make the internal bleeding worse. Do you need more hands? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. In an ideal situation, we'd have the helicopter available. They have bloods for blood transfusion and also have ultrasound to enable the flight paramedic to determine where the internal bleeding is. If they're not in the air... They estimated 25 minutes, yeah, so I think yeah. they better loading for you going. Yeah. Let's just get everything stabilised. It's pretty clear that this patient is bleeding to death internally. So we make the decision that we're not going to put the patient into an induced coma and head straight for the trauma hospital. Every minute, every second we're still on scene is time the patient is bleeding to death. Look at the heart rate. Okay. There's a saying in an ambulance that transport is treatment. And this is one of those cases where transport to hospital could be the difference between life and death. Go. Thomas, squeeze my hand for me. Thomas. After suffering a terrifying seizure, 11 year old Thomas is still not responding to Karina and Dodsey. Thomas. Take a temperature. Absolutely. He didn't have a temp or anything this morning, which surprised the doctor. Well, he's certainly got a temperature. So he's 39.1 at the moment. Whoa. Thomas. Oh, you feel him. He's very warm. Yeah. yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. That's it, mate. There we go. Pop your legs up. With his temperature now climbing past 39 degrees, Thomas requires urgent transport to hospital to find out the cause. Honey, you're hospital. He's got a significant temperature, and so Thomas might suffer from epilepsy. He may have some sort of arrhythmia in his heart that's then caused him to have some sort of hypoxic seizure. You never quite know. With his long history of extreme health problems, this is just another cruel blow for his mum, Jenny. The ordeal of giving her son CPR to try to save his life is finally hitting home. I was in autopilot going through everything with the paramedics on the scene. But when they put him in the ambulance and I couldn't see him, that's when reality of what had happened all hit and I just burst into tears. I was terrified. I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought, oh my goodness, don't you die. In Melbourne's outer east, a motorcyclist has collided with a car and is now fighting for his life. Second dose of fentanyl. Intensive care paramedic Cullen knows time is running out for his patient. We, we need to be ready because we might have to rescue yeah. too. Yeah. We're traumatic head injury, so we're aiming for a blood pressure behind here. Yeah. With this patient, it's not just his brain injury that we're worried about. We're worried about his internal injuries. Let's just have a feel of his chest. Abdo feels tight. Okay. Rigid. Rigid. Yep. He's probably bleeding in his gut, I reckon. We can't do anything for internal bleeding. That needs to be fixed in hospital, and it needs to be fixed in an operating theatre. So we need to get him to hospital as soon as possible. Shats are dropping at the moment. Heart rate's down at 124. I'm going to give him a bit more ketamine because he's yep. writhing around. What's our location, guys? As Cullen continues to work on his critical patient, He's starting to piece together exactly what happened. Right car was driving out of the driveway. Yep, and flipped him. Yeah, didn't see him. I guess one is the start of the vehicle. Yeah. He picked up for hours or anything. Yeah. The snow lock was down 20 metres away. Okay. The car's pulled out, he's facing the TV. Yeah. It's becoming pretty clear that it's amazing that this guy is even alive at all. Every 10 minutes or so, he starts trying to lift his legs again. We just need to keep him semi-sedated. And we're almost about to pull yeah. That's a good thing because this patient needs to be in surgery 10 minutes ago. Cullen and the team are hoping they've made it in time. It's always great when you have a good outcome, but deep down we know that we can't always do that. But 
we give it our best shot anyway. And it's why I wake up every day and it's why I love being a Mike and Paramedic. One of nearly 600 specially trained mobile intensive care paramedics who are called out to the most serious cases. Trailblazer 51-year-old Glennis became one of the very first female MICA paramedics 19 years ago. Every job you go to, you think, oh, God, oh God what am I going to do? And then you get into the job and it all flows and it's OK. Exposure to the worst jobs has definitely toughened her up. You just ask my kids. You know, they might come in and they've, you know, got a cut and they'll go, oh, mama, mate, you haven't lost that limb. Get it, put a bandaid on it, go outside. Lose the limb, mate, or I'm not interested. Poor kids. Those kids, Zoe and Lockie, are very proud of their pioneering mum. I never noticed that women were in the minority. Never thought we were breaking the glass ceiling. And now we're almost at 50% and it's fantastic. What time did you get back? Uh, tonight we finish at 10. At the moment, my daughter Zoe wants to be a paramedic. And I love that. I love that she thinks that um, mum has a career that she might want to do. But as much as I've loved paramedicine, there has been dark times. And I don't want my daughter to see the world through my eyes sometimes. There's times I go home and you want to hug everyone. But then there's not too many jobs you can go to work and say that you've made a difference. And you do get to make a difference to people's lives. I always get teary. Because <laughs> it's a good job. <laughs> Dee and Karina are on their way to hospital with 11-year-old Thomas after he suffered a sudden seizure in the back of the family car. Mum's going to come down. Jenny is following the ambulance, but is still in shock after performing CPR on her son. I thought, oh, my goodness, don't you die on the back seat of the car. I actually said to him, Thomas, you've got to breathe for Mum. Like, breathe for Mum, because this is not how it's going to happen. I'm just going to do this again, mate. Yeah. Paramedic student Maddie is on board today, and there's plenty of tension. 39.3, we're still on the way up. Absolutely frying. Still hardly responding, Thomas's spiking temperature has them all on high alert. That's a big temperature to run up in an hour. Get a bit of mist on him, perhaps. Yeah. With his temperature getting so hot, we need to cool him down because even though he's had this one seizure and he's good now, it doesn't mean that there's not something else going on um, underneath it that could surface on the way to hospital. Just trying to cool you down a little bit. You look at an 11-year-old child that has a host of things going on with his autism um, and seizures and his hole in the heart, and you can't help but think he's quite vulnerable in this time. Just a bit concerned. Mum's in the car behind us, all right? Thomas is a twin. They were born at 24 weeks, gestation. He spent a long time in hospital as Dinny's twin brother. So it's been an ongoing journey for us since his premature birth. And the last 12 years with